So now we, we're transitioning from China to the Middle East, and I'd like to uh, present our first, introduce our first panelist to you and uh, first paper. Um, Hans Lukas Kieser is uh, associate professor at the University of Newcastle in Australia, and he's also the titular professor, a titular professor at the University of Zurich. His research focuses on the demise of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and his most recent book, Talat Pasha, Father of Modern Turkey, Architect of Genocide, uh, came out recently in 2018 with uh, Princeton University Press, but he's also uh, pl published very widely on many, very, many different topics, including uh, uh, on missionary work in the Middle East. Uh, so we're very pleased to have Hans Lucas uh, with us today, and he will uh, start us off. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me at this uh, stimulating uh, conference. Uh, exactly 30 years ago, uh, David Fromkin's, Fromkin's A Peace to End All Peace was published. This was a work that uh, assessed post-Ottoman, post-Great War uh, peacemaking, and I would say it remained valid in many, but not all, points. Time conditioned, it notably underestimated the lasting political uh, momentousness of religion that is uh, manifest these days, the lasting brisance of the, of the Armenian genocide, and the continuity of, the, of late Ottoman, post-Ottoman, identical late Ottoman, post-Ottoman actors, in other words, non-European agency on the ground. The history of the Near East treaties uh, needs to be reassessed based on today's uh, improved knowledge about the long Ottoman war decade and its aftermath in interwar Turkey and uh, greater Europe, a war decade starting in 1911 with Italian invasion in Ottoman Libya. The history of the, uh, the Turkey is a significant early focal point of a more general development in interwar Europe and until today of the post-Ottoman world. Perhaps uh, comparably to China, I have learned a lot during the last panel, but very differently at the same time. In this, in this very short presentation, let me first introduce my topic, compare in, the, in a second uh, section Paris, Paris Sèvres and uh, Lausanne, because you will see why I need to talk not only about Paris, and then uh, third, clarify the road from one to the other by focusing the anti-Paris uh, organization agitation of Turkish nationalism and be underlining the continuity of late Ottoman, post-Ottoman actors. That is the transition of power from Talat's, Talat Pasha's Young Turk to Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's Kemalist, both single party regime with uh, almost identical uh, cadres. In spite of what I announced in my abstract, I will not have time to delve into, into possible compromises, alternative projects that were missed or lost on the road from end of war Istanbul, the Ottoman capital, to Paris and finally Lausanne. The core problem to my sense in all of my books since the 90s, 1990s is the absence of effective social contracts uh, in the Ottoman and post-Ottoman regions. 
And therefore, uh, only a later paper might do justice to Young Turk Finance Minister Javid Bey. I mentioned him in my abstract to Stephen. Uh, uh, and uh, so Javid Bey uh, will not be a topic here. Javid Bey, I just mentioned him very shortly, was a very sensitive uh, uh, observer of the Paris conference and an advisor of the Turkish delegation in Lausanne. He has left uh, a huge and rich uh, diary in Ottoman language, uh, thousands of pages. He was a Turkish nationalist with a difference, also a Dunme, a crypto Jew, finance minister, a close collaborator of Talat Pasha, and finally executed by the Kemalists after a show trial in 1923. So you might be a little bit curious to read my paper later if, if it becomes a chapter. The maps are taken from the Talat book that uh, was just mentioned. For major parts of the post-Ottoman Middle East, the Paris peace uh, system proved not only instable in the medium and long term, it remained dead letter uh, already in the short term. Uh, the Treaty of Sèvres, Paris Sèvres, for the Ottoman Empire was very belated. It was signed more than a year later than that of Versailles. It was never implemented. It was not ratified by the parliament in Istanbul. And it was finally replaced by the Lausanne Near East Peace Treaty of July 1923. The Treaty of Lausanne largely confirmed the existing Paris treaty system as far as the former Arabic parts of the Ottoman Empire were concerned. But it revised the rest, and thus it set a very important revisionist precedent in the history of uh, early interwar Europe. The Paris system, uh, if uh, I try to, to put it in, in a few notions, wanted law-based, state-centered, universal internationalism that ultimately based on the laws of humanity. I refer to Marcus Pike's very recent analysis, Frieden durch Recht. Right from the start, uh, <coughs> this uh, concept uh, failed in Ottoman Turkey because it was, and I, uh, it's a term I have developed in, in the Talat Pasha book, imperially biased. Its implementation depended on Britain and France with their imperial priorities and constraints, what made their stance vulnerable and prevented them to organize serious military power against the adversaries of the, the Paris system, which were former figures of the Young Turk war regime who had a lot to lose uh, from a law-based system à la Paris. In stark contrast to Paris, 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 sorry, Lausanne backed down on <coughs> uh, domestic uh, ru rule of law and minority rights to endorse the right of the powerful, the Islamic Turkish nationalist forces organized by General Mustafa Kemal, the later Atatürk. Except for its endorsement of authoritarianism and right by might from a certain angle, the Lausanne regulations, however, still looked like a state-centered universal internationalism, with finally Turkey also to become a member of the League of Nations. From early 1919, the negotiators in Paris had faced severe problems regarding the Ottomans. They suspended their work, and again we are in, in the, this moment of May. They suspended the, <clears throat> their work on May 13th, 1919, shortly before the Greek army, supported by Britain, occupied Izmir on May 15th, and Kemal Ataturk started on May 19th to reorganize the Muslim forces in Anatolia from the east, that is, far from European forces. 
These hadn't uh, occupied Anatolia except marginally in Istanbul and in zones in the south. In that May 1919, the general mood among Muslims in Turkey turned from repudiation of the former Young Turk rule, from its failures and its crimes, its corruption, uh, and from recognition of guilt, remorse, and readiness for change of what one could read in the Istanbul press, to re-embrace or embracing uh, the former anti-Western Islamic war unity and to a vociferous denial of responsibility for crimes, especially against the Armenians. <clears throat> uh, this uh, mood henceforth uh, fuel, fueled a proactive struggle that the personalities of the former regime <coughs> were leading since the immediate aftermath of World War I. They were active in Anatolia, in European exile, and in Bolshevik Russia, among them the former Grand Vizier Talat in Berlin, and traveling throughout Europe freely under another pseudonym. <clears throat> Beside the minister, Talat had been the leading party boss of the Young Turk Committee Union and Progress, shortly CUP. The CUP was a dictatorial party <clears throat> that ruled the empire since 1913, so really the first imperial single party uh, regime, with uh, Kemal, the later Atatürk, as its member and one of its prominent generals, who was, however, not involved in politics. Talat was the regime's uh, executive, his friend Zia Kalp, its ideologue, and to this day, the undisputed spiritual father of Turkish nationalism. Both were party central committee members. I have emphasized in my new book, this the synergy of Talat and Kalp. So if you want the duumvirate, instead of what one always says, the triumvirate, which was true just for a short eve of World War I. I have also argued that the CUP regime pioneered right-wing revolutionism in other words, proto-fascist politics. The propagandists of the early Kemalist movement claimed Muslim majority in contrast to non-Muslim minority, and to be in full accordance with the Wilsonian principle of self-rule. They portrayed themselves as the true victims of modern history and the Great War, and of course the victors in Paris, while they de depicted the Armenians and other minoritarian survivors of CUP persecution and their Western protectors or supporters as Islamophobic and Turcophobic imperialists. Caroline Libisch, our colleague here, has recently published a very instructive article, she will certainly also tell us more now, on the then master propagandist Saf Safet Atabinen, a collaborator of Talat, then of Atatürk, secretary of the Turkish delegation in Lausanne and deputy in Ankara. These ex-CUP forces struggled against the emerging Paris peace system from spring 1919. Uh, and <clears throat> concretely led in Anatolia from May 1919 by Kemal, Mustafa Kemal. They declared the Istanbul government and the Sultanate Caliphate under foreign tutelage. This rhetoric won over also the Sunni Kurds, who feared especially restitution of property to Armenian survivors. Kemal's ex-CUP circle organized a national revolutionary counter-government in Ankara, while negotiations in Paris crystallized 1920 in the Treaty of Sèvres. Whereas the Istanbul government represented the Ottoman Empire in Paris Sèvres, the Ankara government represented two years later Turkey in Lausanne. There were two red racks to Ankara in the Sèvres Treaty. The limitation of Turkish territory to most, not all, 
of Asia Minor, and most importantly, a serious limitation of sovereignty, including international justice. The Kemalist victory in the war for Anatolia in 1922 set the determining matrix for the revisionist conference of Lausanne. And in principle, the Treaty of Lausanne between Turkey and the victors of World War I is still the valid treaty for the post-Ottoman world. I need some water. The Sevres Treaty planned a Turkey reduced to most, but not all, of Asia Minor. Depending on referenda or later decisions, parts at the Aegean coast should be given to Greece, of southeastern Anatolia to Kurdish autonomy, and of northeastern Anatolia to an independent Armenia. The Sevres Treaty <coughs> limited the sovereignty of the future Ottoman state more than that of any other state in the Paris Treaties, as far as I understand. These were the relevant regulations. European experts would elaborate the modern justice system. An international commission would check the budget because there were decades of, of, of very of severe problems uh, with the Ottoman finances. There would be robust, robust minority protections, and war criminals would be prosecuted before an international tribunal, especially those involved in the crimes against the Armenians. More than a million Armenians robbed and exterminated. After the Volt phase in Lausanne, the West long forgot that prosecution of those responsible for these crimes was a crucial issue at Paris. Territorially speaking, the Ankara government was by far most successful, thanks to Lausanne, in the East. There, it entirely suppressed the non-Turkish, especially Armenian, but also Kurdish claims supported by the Sevres Treaty. The assurance of Armenian collective rights <clears throat> was uh, particularly important for Paris because uh, of the far-reaching extermination of that Armenian group in that old settlement regions not only of uh, Armenians, but uh, Armenians, Assyrians, Greek Orthodox Rome, as far as Christians were concerned, Kurds, Alevi, Sunni, and other Kurds, Yezidis, and of course also the uh, Sunni, uh, Kurds and Turks. Mustafa Kemal and Talat agreed in their post-war uh, correspondence in rejecting any prosecution of war guilt, and a fortiori any collective rights of Armenians in Asia Minor. If we accept the Lausanne Treaty as the last pillar of the post-1918 Paris system, we must deal with deep contradictions. Lausanne largely dismantled Paris internationalist framework. That is a law-based law order of constitutional countries, or if you want, constitutionalism domestically and internationally. In its dealing with early Kemalist Turkey, the, West, the Western uh, representative gave de facto up on domestic rule of law, human and minority rights, and on international checks and balances. Also, the diplomats at Lausanne, Turks included and emphatically, still largely used Paris language and rhetoric. They actually they valued the constitutional internationalism. This concept already before, partly of course, served agendas of victors. We have heard this already. While at the same time, however, uh, it binded the victor, victors also. Thank you. Lausanne, in contrast, reduced the language of rights and international liability almost at absurdity. 
We might therefore, from a totally different angle, as well consider the Lausanne Treaty as belonging not to the Paris system, but to a new post-Paris category of interwar diplomacy, and not as the last pillar of the Paris system, a new diplomacy marked both by, both by interest-driven Western politics that had given up on the rights of weaker groups, and the embrace of post-Ottoman strongmen who all were rooted in the 1910s, particularly in the era of Talat Pasha's imperial single party rule. Henceforth, detached from Paris principle, post Lausanne actors in the West fully endorsed such strongman's political style, their rewriting of the past, of the immediate past, and their claim to unrestricted, unchecked national, or in the Saudi case, royal sovereignty, sovereignty and recent military conquests. Not less importantly, for a hundred years to come, the Lausanne Conference approved forcible large-scale demographic engineering that was entirely based on the distinction between Muslims and Christians, and B, entirely endorsed the preceding Ottoman decade of ethnic cleansing, including the genocide of the Armenians. And this ethnic cleansing under Talat also entirely based on the, on the fundamental distinction between Muslims and Christians. Uh, I have come to the end of my time, even not to the end of my paper, but uh, that's the destiny of, of many <laughs> speakers. So I cannot talk now about what is behind the curtain of this uh, anti-Paris Turkish nationalism, how it was organized, etc. But I'm sure that you will a little bit talk about this. Uh, Caroline, my, our colleague Caroline uh, Livish, and uh, so we, or we can also take it up then during the discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, John Boonstra, who received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in August of 2018. Overall, his research asks the question of how unique sites of colonial contact uh, shaped ideologies of gender and empire. Um, his dissertation uh, a mandate uh, to protect, protect imperial encounters and effective ideologies between France and Lebanon examines the formation of an imperial relationship between France and Lebanon in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, let me begin by thanking Albert and Steve, um, not least for giving us all uh, an excuse to come to Paris, um, although I'm currently based in Florence, so I can't really complain too much. Um, I also want to begin with a caveat to my paper's title in that I'm not beginning, I'm beginning neither with Maronite Patriarch Elias Hayek nor the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, in the spirit of some of the earlier uh, presentations this morning, I'm, I'm going to start with a, a lesser known, less heralded conference before, and with the Patriarch's deputy before talking about the Patriarch himself at the Paris Peace Conference. By the end of the war, Lebanon itself had become a martyr. So proclaimed the Maronite Archbishop Alfred Khoury, speaking in, a, in January 1919 at a conference convened in Marseille to discuss France's role in the Arab provinces of the former Ottoman Empire. The martyr of Lebanon, Khoury declared, represented the tragic coronation and bloody consecration of its historic relationship with France. Having suffered a loss of nearly a third of its population to famine and disease, conditions exacerbated by a French-led wartime blockade of the Eastern Mediterranean, Lebanon emerged from the Great War with its historic connection to France palpably damaged. At the same time, amidst the collapse of Lebanon's erstwhile Ottoman sovereign, France emerged as the most likely protector of Lebanese autonomy, both before and during the Paris Peace Conference. In the immediate post-war context, 
Ties between Lebanon and France were tested at a key moment of colonial opportunity. Organized by the Chambers of Commerce of Marseille and Lyon, the summit at which Khoury proclaimed Lebanon's martyrdom brought together an array of politicians, activists, and intellectuals, as well as businessmen, journalists, teachers, jurists, and other professionals. The purpose of the Marseille gathering was to articulate across multiple domains the extent of French interests and influence throughout the Near East. Experts analyzed different facets of French involvement in Greater Syria, divided into four thematic sections, economic and agricultural, archeological, historical, and ethnographic, cultural and edu educational, and medical and scientific. These topics were brought together under the conference's title, the Congrès Français de Syrie. Preceding the Paris Peace Conference by some two weeks, the Congrès served in a sense as a dress rehearsal for French claims over Lebanon and Syria. Both partook of an immediate post-war impulse to resolve new questions and pursue new opportunities in a potentially new post-imperial or newly imperial world order. The conference's purview was broad and so too was its conception of the Syrian lands with commercial or cultural ties to France. While some participants insisted that their projects were not aimed at colonization, most advanced a more explicitly and more far-reaching imperialist agenda, conceived as the rightful heritage of France's traditional involvement across the Near East. The Congress asserted the president of one section, quote, exercise a real influence on the fate of this Semitic Orient this France du Levant. In the post-war moment of uncertain imperial arrangements, as statesmen and delegates prepared to debate peace terms in Versailles, the meeting in Marseille sought to stake a claim to a hitherto unrealized French Levant, a fantasy of empire grounded in empirical studies and material interests, but bound together by a shared conviction in its affective ties to France. It was in the context of this conference that Archbishop Alfred Khoury made his lament. If he focused his account on Lebanon specifically, rather than all of greater Syria, Khoury explained, this owed not only to its definite national character and traditional autonomy, but especially to its particular experience during the Great War. Tracing Lebanon's connection to France back to the Crusades, he attributed its wartime suffering, the famine and persecution that wiped out a third of its population and should have quote, shaken the civilized world with a shiver of horror to this very attachment for which the Ottoman regime had punished the Lebanese population through subjugation and starvation. He did not mention, on the other hand, France's role in precipitating the famine. Rather, he avowed, those who had perished represented fallen martyrs to the French cause. And instead of begrudging the mortal consequences of Franco-Lebanese alliance, Khoury embraced Lebanon's martyrdom its sacrifice ensured that this bond was sealed in tears and blood. Out of the death and despair of the war, he envisioned the emergence of a purified and better world, one in which France renewed its role as Lebanon's age-old protector, and the Lebanese pledged in return their enduring gratitude, their touching and occasionally fierce loyalty. The martyred Lebanon that Alfred Khoury presented to the Marseille Conference was then a martyr to France. As such, it was based on the same calculus through which French advocates and officials had interpreted the Ottoman executions of Syrian and Lebanese notables during the war. The martyrdom of Lebanese Christians, epitomized by the public hangings of prominent activists in 1915 and 1916, intensified the imperative to rescue victims of anti-French animus and heightened the stakes of French imperial investment. Suffering functioned as proof of fidelity, which persevered through the trials of occupation, oppression, and starvation. For the Maronite Archbishop Khoury, of course, appealing to French alliance, especially after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, was also a political strategy aimed at ensuring support for a Maronite-dominated state entity. To achieve this objective, however, the conditions of mutual Franco-Lebanese attachment needed to be discursively rehabilitated as well as politically reenacted. At the same time, the extent of France's empire across Syria was left to be delineated, delineated and defended. 
pre-war imperial fantasies gave rise to the contradictions of colonial authority, and pledges of support gave way to policies of suppression. An ostensibly age-old legacy of protection had to be forged anew within an imperial system that at once constrained and encouraged French colonial prerogative. While a League of Nations mandate accorded France political supervision over both Lebanon and Syria, what I call its ideological mandate to protect encompassed at once an isolated Lebanon and an imagined Levant. While Khoury singled out Lebanon for its particular wartime anguish and enduring loyalty, its martyrdom was also entwined in a larger imperial web. The idealized configuration of La France du Levant was imperfectly superimposed on the political landscape of the Near East. As the region took shape in the wake of war and Ottoman dissolution, French and British, as well as Lebanese and Syrian, politicians and activists sought to carve out spheres of influence along favorable, favorable boundaries. Notwithstanding competing wartime agreements, it was the newly founded League of Nations that would adjudicate the status of former Ottoman territories in the Middle East. The guiding consideration was not popular opinion, as the muted impact of the American-led King Crane Commission attested, but the continuation, indeed expansion, of European imperial authority over the non-European world. Beyond tracing these lines of continuity or expansion lies an ideological ambiguity engendered by post-war French claims of connection to Lebanon and confluence of interests and influence in the Levant. Under the rubric of a colonialist con Congress devoted to achieving a French Syria, the concept of a martyr of Lebanon reveals an underlying tension between French imperial ambitions and imagination. The idealized tradition of a singular Franco-Lebanese re relationship, once confronted with the imperial vacuum after 1918, came into conflict with a colonial agenda that envisioned a robust French presence throughout Syria. If the economic interests of the Marseillais and Lyonnais did not convince the full ranks of the French Parti Colonial of the latter, colonizing the Levant was alluring precisely because basing an imperial endeavor on principles of affection seems significantly less costly than policies of occupation. This calculation not only shaped the divergent colonial trajectories of both Syria and Lebanon, it also resuscitated an ideology of French imperial benevolence gravely shaken after the First World War. Several months later, Alfred Khoury's superior, Maronite patriarch Elias Pierre Hoyek, served as the president of a second Leb Lebanese delegation to the Paris Peace Conference. Hoyek advanced his community's aspirations for an independent, expanded state of Lebanon under French guarantee in the post-war order. Historians have mostly situated his testimony within studies of Middle Eastern nationalist movements, specifically the Maronite ideology of Lebanism. They have focused less attention on how the languages of martyrdom that he mobilized proved essential in shaping the post-war imperial context. These opened a new realm of discursive as well as political possibility, fertile for demands of Lebanese autonomy and French imperial protection, but sown with unresolved ambiguities over both Lebanon's status and the meaning of the colonial mandate system that would emerge. Hawaii's, as well as Khouri's, calls for French protection drew from an affective vocabulary of martyrdom and obligation to affirm Lebanon's standing within a French realm of influence. These claims function not only to create a sense of post-war indebtedness, they also crafted a narrative of suffering that effaced France's own responsibility for causing the famine that had decimated Lebanon's population during the war. The Maronite patriarch, moreover, was not only aligning Lebanese attitudes under the rubric of French protection, he also contrasted Lebanon's position in the hierarchy of empire as well as civilization with that of neighboring Syria. The eventual creation of Greater Lebanon as a political entity, I propose, occurred within an imperial framework in which Syria functioned as the violent backdrop against which Lebanon would be defined and defended. Among the tasks of the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, assembled to settle the multiple lingering questions posed by the dissolution of three major empires, was to mock up plans to allocate former Ottoman and German imperial possessions to France and Great Britain. 
They would be neither colonies nor protectorates, but semi-colonial mandates. And I should add to, to Japan as well, as we've, as we've heard uh, this afternoon. Indigenous actors also seized the opportunity to make direct appeals to the European powers, appeals which were more often than not ignored. Lebanese voices may have resonated among their ostensible French protectors, not simply out of traditions of sentimental allegiance, but also thanks to the appealing narrative of Lebanon's martyrdom for France during the First World War. Amidst competing political agendas over boundaries and modes of governance, the language of martyrdom proved essential in shaping the post-war imperial context. The testimony of the Maronite Patriarch heading the second Lebanese delegation to Versailles, the first had been a, a secular um, group from Lebanon's administrative council um, earlier in, in the series of meetings. Uh, this exemplifies, the, visit, the testimony of the Maronite Patriarch exemplifies the pressure from Christian Lebanese, chiefly Maronite activists, dubbed Lebanus in the historiography of Middle Eastern nationalist movements, for an independent, expanded state of Lebanon under French guarantee in the post-war order. This was indeed Hoyek's objective. As Carol Hakim has demonstrated, the Lebanist vision with it, and its cartographic manifestation incorporating Beirut as well as the Mediterranean coast and the Bekaa Valley into a greater Lebanon came into focus precisely at the moment leading up to its ultimate achievement in 1920. Hoyek had been a devoted partisan of France throughout his tenure as, pa as patriarch, pledging at the outset of the Great War Maronite and Lebanese loyalty, quote, to the traditions of attachment that a long series of benefits had established toward France their generous protector, end quote. After the war, Hawaiik invoked the suffering from famine as well as from fighting of those Lebanese who had, quote, paid with their blood for their allied sympathies and their love of liberty. Policies designed to bring about the calculated starvation of Lebanon's population, as well as targeted executions, he contended, represented Turkish and German reprisals for Lebanese sympathies for France. He claimed that it was the, quote, attachment of the Lebanese to the Allies' cause and their loyalty to France that had provoked these measures of savage repression, which endured even after Lebanon was abandoned by its erstwhile protector. Hawaiik here deployed an argument analogous to wartime pleas for French intervention, recalibrated to invoke a sense of post-war indebtedness. Since affective bonds to France had imperiled Lebanese survival, Hawaiik requested in exchange for this devotion, recognition of Lebanon's protected status. The desiderata that Hawaiik submitted to the peace conference and for which he appealed to French obligation were not limited to the independence and expansion of Lebanon. They also included an explicit call for French protection under the mandate regime. In accepting the mandatory system of the League of Nations, based on Lebanon's need for political tutelage and economic support, he also drew from an affective vocabulary to affirm its standing within a French realm of influence. While he stressed the imperative of Lebanese sovereign autonomy, he also conceived of Lebanon as a distant extension of France itself. This terrain of French culture had been cultivated over centuries, he claimed, and was marked by an affinity like one rarely sees in the history of peoples. Hawaiik, of course, was not simply operating within a traditional idiom of Maronite alliance with France. He was also seeking his communities and his own political advantage. But his testimony can also be read as evidence of the need to continually reiterate and thereby reconstruct a narrative of stability and mutual benefit between Maronite Lebanon and Imperial France. The Patriarch also made sure to distinguish Lebanon from neighboring Syria. The two countries were delineated as respective zones of amity and antagonism, paralleling tensions within the French imperial mission between imperatives of Christian protection and illusions of Muslim friendship. The latter, though, would be belied by France's victory over and protracted counterinsurgency campaign against Syrian separatists throughout the 1920s. To justify his argument for Lebanese exceptionalism, Hawaiik marshaled familiar tropes of Lebanon's Phoenician origin 
as well as its history of autonomy since 1860. He distinguished Lebanon especially for its ties to Western Europe, with its mores, its affinities, its Western culture. As opposed to the nomadic population of Syria, he proclaimed Lebanon, quote, constitutes the principal seat of Western culture in the East. Huayek attributed these qualities not only to historic reasons, but also to essential differences between the two peoples. And he bristled at attempts to, quote, confuse Lebanon with, and Syria, or rather, to dissolve Lebanon within Syria. Considering the ambiguity with which Lebanese, especially within its, within its extensive diaspora population, were often referred to as Syrians, the Maronite leader rejected the latter designation as generic and inappropriate. Nothing unites these two countries, he concluded, neither their past, nor their aspirations, nor their intellectual or political evolution. Even as Hawaii underscored the distinction between Lebanon and Syria, welcoming the role of French counsel and friendship in securing an essentially Lebanese government, he also called on Mandate France to ensure, quote, the national unity of the different communities of Lebanon. The dual imperatives of Syro-Lebanese division and Lebanon's internal unity were not simply reducible to questions of religion and sect, nor solely to an assumption of Christian affinity and Muslim antagonism. Imperial allegiance was meant to extend across confessional bounds, notwithstanding Lebanon's distinct connection to France. Neither should Huayek's appeal be merely dismissed as the disingenuous posturing of a Maronite nationalist. Rather, this paradoxical formation was built into the very imperial system that structured relations between France and the Levant. The dream of France as a great Muslim power persisted alongside confidence in the particular allegiance of the Lebanese as inheritors of a timeless affinity. Assurances of France's historic protection of Lebanon coexisted with claims to Muslim affection, even as Lebanon's status as a Christian stronghold was reaffirmed in juxtaposition to the repression of anti-colonial revolts and notions of Muslim hostility across greater Syria. And when greater Lebanon assumed its officially enlarged borders on September 1, 1920, the new mandatory state incorporated, incorporated what would prove to be to Lebanon's dismay in the, in the decades that would follow, a substantially larger Muslim population. Even before achieving its quasi-independence from Syria after the Paris Peace Conference, the idea of Lebanon was premised on an essential difference, yet mandated an integral coherence. Thank you. Thank you for that paper. Um, next is uh, Carolyn Liebisch, who is a postdoc researcher and lecturer in modern and global history at the University of Kiel, Germany. In October 2018, she completed her PhD from Heidelberg University with a dissertation on Turkey and the League of Nations, an entangled history of nation building. Thank you very much, Albert. Uh, I'm not sure if I can live up to the very high expectation of continuing hans Lukas Kiesa's paper, but I think that my paper will link in with it in many ways. So, future maps of Asia Minor were unfolded on the negotiation table at the Paris Peace Conference in early summer 1919. There were many designs and they varied greatly in terms of borders and territories. A common feature of all plans, however, was the partition of Ottoman Anatolia. And, and this is what my presentation is about, they all envisioned the creation of some sort of international administration or mandates in Asia Minor. This retrospective and somewhat counterfactual map shown here, for instance, visualizes the scheme suggested by the American-led King Crane Commission, John just mentioned, that visited Turkey in June 1919. Their plan included the transformation of Istanbul into an international city, as well as the placement of the whole of Turkey under US League of Nations mandate. Three months earlier at the conference, Lloyd George and Clemenceau had supported a similar proposal by Colonel House. House had suggested U.S. administered League of Nations mandates over Istanbul, the Straits, Armenia, and in a kind of weakened form, also over Turkey itself. 
Mutual Wilson, worrying that he might lack national support, came up with the counter proposal to place the entire Turkey under French mandate. Meanwhile, Clemenceau and Lloyd George came up with yet another alternative, an Italian mandate over South Anatolia, a French mandate over the rest of Anatolia, and an American League of Nations mandate over Armenia. Istanbul and the Straits, they proposed, should form a separate state under American protection. In the midst of these debates, Eric Drummond, the first secretary of the League of Nations, advanced his own proposal recommending that Istanbul should become a free city under the protection of the League of Nations. Now, this was only a small selection of all plans on the table, but I think it was enough to demonstrate that internationalized forums of administration formed a key idea in the debates. The idea of international administration itself had emerged back in the 19th century. Ever since, it often served imperialist and colonial purposes. The Ottoman Empire, whose state finances fell under the control of a European orchestrated international debt administration in the 1880s, is a case in point. In the aftermath of World War I, the instrument of international administration reached a new dimension with the foundation of the League of Nations and its mandate system. The League, just like international organizations in the 19th century, used discourses on civilizational development as a pretext for foreign control, desovereignization, and imperialist infiltration. The majority of works on this topic, especially on the mandate system, focuses on the League of Nations mandates in former German colonies and in the Ottoman Arab provinces. Surely this makes sense because actually these are the regions where the mandate rule was established. In Turkey, besides the occupation period and the international straits regime, uh, the issue of mandates and international administrations was actually quite uh, short-lived. Yet my aim, aim is to convince you that it is nevertheless worth taking this issue of mandates and international administration in Anatolia, in Anatolia into account, even though they never materialized. So yes, for the most part, they remained but talk, schemes, and a unratified treaty. But, as I hope to show, the mandate debate did have a significant effect on Ottoman activists protesting the peace conference in 1919. Before I share with you some insights from the propaganda pamphlets they published, I would like to give a short overview about who those activists actually were and which role they played in the post-war years. During the Paris Peace Conference, official Ottoman diplomacy was in deadlock. The Supplin Port sent a delegation to Paris whose plea for territorial integrity the Allied Supreme Council harshly rejected, even ridiculed. The Allies indicated that the Ottoman Empire would undergo a territorial transformation. As a key reason, they cited the alleged cruelty and inability of the Turks to run a civilized government. Given the relative powerlessness of the Ottoman government in face of the empire's petition, Ottoman intellectuals plunged into propagandistic activities. Some of them were based in Istanbul, others in Paris, Geneva, or other European cities. Together, they formed a sort of transnational network addressing the peace conference and the surrounding public in English and French. First, we might say that the deadlock of official diplomacy led to the decentralization of Ottoman foreign relations with a host of activists barging in. In terms of their political attitudes, the activists were a heterogeneous group, ranging from right-wingers to national liberals. Yet most of them belonged to the wider Young Turk movement, and they all shared a common agenda, that is the defense of Turkey as a sovereign and independent state that should cover at least all of Anatolia, including Istanbul. They were all Turkish nationalists actively involved in nation building. Some of the activists attempted to create a unified movement. They started initiatives like the so-called National Congress, a cross-party coalition founded in late 1918 by Esad Ashik and former members of the uh, Young Turk Committee of Union and Progress, the CUP, uh, Hans Lukas Kieser mentioned and explained. Another example for the attempt to create a unified movement is the so-called national bloc called together by the liberal president of the Ottoman Senate, Ahmed Rizza. These initiatives were not identical with the Turkish national movement formed by the group around Mustafa Kemal Pasha in summer 1919 and ultimately taking a militant shape. Rather, they were part of a network of civil resistance that later integrated into the national movement. In order to strengthen their goals, all of the activists invoked Wilson and his 14 points, which had promised, quote, the Turkish portion of the present Ottoman Empire a secure serenity, unquote. Yet, 
it would be superficial to describe their agenda simply as a Turkish Wilsonian moment. So also from my side, um, the appeal to provincialize uh, the Wilsonian moment. I see three reasons at play. First, the Ottoman activists utilized not only Wilsonianism to bolster their nationalist agenda, but in many cases also pan-Islamism, pan-Turkism, or socialism. Taken together, their rhetoric was an ideological potpourri with nationalism at its heart. A second reason, their concept of nation was rooted in the Young Turk movement. It implied the idea of a homogeneous Turkish Muslim nation. I would therefore support the thesis of Volker Prott, um, who suggests in his, in his books on the politics of self-determination that actors in Central and Southeastern Europe translated Wilson's um, language into ethno-nationalist programs of ter territorial reorganization. I will come back to that point later. There is a third reason why, in my view, the narrative of a Turkish Wilsonian moment falls short. While the Ottoman activists' writings during the Paris moment indeed revealed the influence of Wilsonian language, they were equally influenced by the language of mandates. Mandates mattered for the nationalist Ottoman activists. For um, Ahmed Reshid, for example, who belonged to the liberal Turkish diaspora in Geneva. <laughs> Reading the newspaper Journal de Genève in March 1919, he learned about the petition schemes I just mentioned. The League of Nations he read might supervise foreign mandates over Anatolia and Istanbul. Outraged, he wrote a letter to Woodrow Wilson in which he bemoaned the lack of Wilsonian idealism in Paris. Um, mandates, he complained, were nothing but annexation and old-style Machiavellianism. Two months earlier, also in Switzerland, Mehmet Halil Halid had published his pamphlet. A devoted young Turk and pan-Islamist Halil Halid charged the British government of imposing control, quote, under the pretext of introducing good order or doing civilizing work, unquote. He strongly warned against, quote, the continuation of imperialist practices in the League of Nations. International administration, he stated, is as bad as the worst form of autocratic tyranny. <laughs> Like Ahmed Reshid and Halil Halil, most Ottoman pamphleteers commented on the Allied plans to internationalize Turkish territory. Almost all of them stressed the civilizing mission those plans implied. Let me introduce you to some more examples. The authors of several pamphlets published by the Turkish National Club in Geneva in 1919 declared that, quote, no, the Turks were, were not the destroyers of civilizations, but on the contrary, unquote. They argued that already since the 19th century, the Turkish society and its government were devoted to, quote, the manifestation of modernity and the march towards Occidental civilization. Despite that fact, they complained, quote, our enemies pretend that the history of the Turks offers an irrefutable evidence providing their incapacity to adapt to civilization. First, one has to assign them tutors, that is, install the mandate regime in the Ottoman Empire. They took strong offense with the Allies' plans to apply to Turkish heartlands the same mandate article they had applied to its Arab provinces and the German colonies. Regions, the activists thought, that were much less civilized than Turkey itself. In their eyes, League mandates were nothing but, quote, protectorates in disguise, and the League of Nations Covenant the justification for a mission civilisatrice. In a similar vein, argued the National Congress I mentioned earlier. In a 200-page long pamphlet, its members commented on Turkey's position at the peace conference. They argued against the image of Turkey as being essentially uncivilized and thus unqualified for its sovereign existence. Quote, Turks are neither barbarians nor resistant to civilization, unquote. While the authors admitted that Turkey lagged behind European civilization, they also stressed that this deficit, quote, could not be remedied by a mandate, for that would be an obstacle to their evolution already underway. If the Allies really wanted, still quoting, to promote the development of people, then they would have to grant Turkey, end of quote, a strong Turkish Muslim state as a base for progress. The authors first turned the civilizing doctrine into a strong case for serenity. Only, quote, a completely sovereign Turkey in its natural borders, that is Anatolia, could form the real base for its development. 
All the pamphlets I have quoted so far appeared in 1919, when it actually seemed still possible that the whole of Turkey might become a league mandate. With the Treaty of Sèvres a year later, the mandate option was off the table. The treaty, however, provided for many other forms of internationalized control, like the transformation of Istanbul into an internationally administered city and the extension of the Ottoman public debt administration. Ahmed Rousseau, who was the founder of the national bloc I mentioned earlier, was in Paris when the treaty's terms transpired. He complained that the Treaty of Sèvres did not offer Turkey membership in the League of Nations, but rather uses the League to undermine its sovereignty and independence. In the name of development, he complained, the Allies utilized the League to treat people like children. I could cite many more examples, actually. Uh, obviously, I could have also cited Rishid Safet, which today is not part of the talk. But I hope it was already enough to show that Ottoman activists during the Paris moment not only opposed Allied occupation and the partition of Turkey, but they also and explicitly opposed the civilizational claim of international administrations with which the Allies sought to legitimize their plans. They made it clear that the Turks were already civilized in their eyes and that any further progress in civilization would, necess would necessitate national independence. At this point, it is important to stress that those activists in their same pamphlets turned on Armenian and Greek minorities. The nation whose de independence they defended was not some multi-ethnic community, but already thought of as an essentially Turkish Muslim nation that needed to be defended not only against European imperialism, but also against Armenians and Greeks. Ahmed Reshid, for example, spoke of, quote, Armenian hatred against Turks and Armenian intrigues and Greek machinations. While he did, uh, did not deny the, quote, tragic events during the war, by which he meant the Armenian genocide, he rejected any general notion of responsibility on part of Turkey for the violence committed against Christian minorities. The authors of the National Congress even went so far as to claim the, quote, outrageous and atrocious conduct of the Armenian for the Armenian's own fate. Obviously, the intention behind such comments was to delegitimize any allied punishment of Turkey, as well as Armenian and Greek territorial aspirations in Anatolia. Beyond that, there existed a link between the activists' rejection of culpability um, and their attempts to prove Turkey's civilizational capacity. Like the Allies, who used Turkey's alleged uncivilizedness to justify their post-war design, Armenian and Greek politicians had pointed to the Turks' supposedly intrinsic cruelness and barbarity and demanded to put an end to Turkish rule. So during the peace conference, humanitarian concerns went actually hand in hand with judgments regarding Turkey's ability to civilization and ultimately through that to serenity. Um, so first point I would like to make with my presentation is that the Ottoman activist stance on civilization and serenity should not be seen separately from their exclusive concept of nation. When they fought for the recognition of an independent state in the community of civilized states, the, um, the future state they had in mind was, and here I quote the National Congress, more compact, more homogeneous, finally having become a nation. If we look at the pamphleteers' activities only in the context of imperialist internationalism and Eurocentrism, we run the risk of overlooking the fact that they were not only anti-imperialist, but also nationalist, ethno-nationalist, and in some cases, openly hostile to minorities. Um, so this was my first point, the link between uh, civilizationalism and ethno-nationalism in the activists' ideological mindset. And um, my second point leads me already to the concluding part of this presentation. As I've tried to show the peacemaker's preference for international administration and its underlying civilizational doctrine left a deep imprint on Ottoman activists. In response, they tried to reassert and prove Turkey's civilizational status. For example, by highlighting its historical and cultural achievements, which they also do in those pamphlet, uh, pamphlets, although I could not um, get deep into this topic uh, in this presentation. By doing so, they actually confirmed the Western notion of civilization and accepted it as a valid principle of international order. So kind of internalized it, 
but at the same time they try to turn it from a negative diagnosis, uh, diagnosis to a positive right to a sovereign existence in the international community. Uh, in the Turkish Republic, founded in 1923, the idea of self-civilization developed into a key agenda of Kemalist nation building and the transformation of Turkey into a modern European state. This is what the founders had in mind. The Paris Peace Conference, this would be a second point, uh, was a crucial factor in this development. Its no negotiations made it clear to Ottoman elites that the First World War had not nullified the old standard of civilization in international organization. And that, in order to gain a secure serenity, in the words of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, it was essential to get rid of any accusations of uncivilizedness. All four discourses on civilization in the Ottoman Empire had a long and contested history that predated the peace conference, of course. I would argue that the Paris moment, with its drive towards imperialist internationalism, was a catalyst for fixing the idea of self-civilization or an internal civilizing mission in Turkish nation building and in the Turkish national identity as well. Considering the lasting effect on Turkish nation building, a look at the unrealized mandates in Anatolia and the very real debates they triggered can also contribute to our understanding of the meaning of the League of Nations mandate system. As Susan Peterson in her book on the mandate system argues, its biggest impact was generating talk on the international level about the legitimacy of colonial structures, basically. With an eye on the Ottoman Turkish case, I would add to that its lasting discursive repercussions on the regional and national level as well. And in order to grasp these repercussions, um, as well as the general transformational role of the Paris moment on the spot in the region, I believe we must look beyond state diplomacy. And um, in this sense, I hope that my presentation might have also um, illustrated the epistemic value of transnational approaches, which I think um, many, as we have also seen in the other panels, many of the speakers here um, follow, uh, the value of transnational approaches that include non-state actors into the history of post-war global reordering. Thank you all for these very stimulating panel uh, papers and also for uh, keeping uh, to the time limit. I'll, I'll just open up to questions and uh, allow people to... Uh, yes, Professor Zellico, please. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite the panelists to comment on choice. So, um, Dr. Kieser's presentation is a very challenging presentation. If I, took, if I heard this presentation, I would say we need to have defended the Sevres system in 1920, 21, and 22, so that we don't create a proto-fascist state littered with the maps of massacres and concentration camps that you so vividly portray. Or are we arguing that actually no, the Lausanne paradigm is a superior paradigm? We would prefer actually to adopt a, a realistic approach in which we withdraw power from these places and allow them to set up ethno-nationalist regimes like the one Kamal is setting up in Anatolia all over the Muslim Middle East. And yes, that may be bad for some Christians and other minority groups, but uh, that's just nature taking its course. So I want to kind of invite you in a way to return to the world of the peacemakers informed by the fact that you now see these two paradigms playing out, the alternatives for the Maronite Christians in Lebanon, if they don't want the French to come back, what ethno-nationalist state uh, and what or warfare takes its place instead of the French, and invite the panelists now to consider sort of, if, if, not, the, if not the Lausanne paradigm or the Saudi Arabia paradigm replacing the Hejaz and all of that, if not that paradigm, then what? Right. And can we collect maybe one more one more question to go with that? Yeah. So, I thank you for the uh, I, I thank you for the presentations, and I, I have a kind of a number of specific questions. Uh, you were showing maps, some different maps uh, of uh, how the Anatolia might be reorganized. 
And I wondered what the level of information of the peacemakers was. Of course, Harold Nicholson is a very humorous description, as I recall, of Lloyd George and uh, Clemenceau confusing a topographic map with an ethnographic map. Uh, so uh, you showed a map of Kurdistan. Uh, to what extent did they know where, in fact, Kurdistan might be? Um, the, uh, the other point I'd make is, of course, you, you spoke of uh, autonomy, Article 62, but there was Article 64, which said if once they had autonomy, then the Kurds might be offered a state of their own after a year if they, if they wanted it. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, just a series of, of, but you raised some very interesting points. To what extent did the, the, the Turkish nationalists that you talk about to what extent that they consider, for example, again, to come back to the Kurdistan question, whether their state is going to be Turkish? Did they say, well, the Kurds are Turks, as Ataturk later was, or was there some rep recognition of uh, uh, different entities? And, and finally, to what extent did, we, we talked about the Christians, but what about the other minorities? The Al Alawites, the Yazidis, the Mandeans, uh, it, figure into the discussions of the um, peacemakers. Thank you. Um, Caroline, would you like to start? Um, yeah, sure. If I may, I would start with your last question regarding the role of Kurds and Kurdistan in the nationalist mindset. So I think there again, it's important to note that uh, they were not a heterogeneous group. And the, there were liberals among them. And um, some of the liberals, one of them I actually showed, Ahmed Rashid, another person was Sheriff Pasha, who was actually the representative of Kurdish interests at the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, the interesting thing is he uh, not only went to Paris to speak for um, the autonomy of Kurdistan, but also for a sovereign and autonomous Turkey. So he kind of represented both uh, countries. And Sheriff Pasha and Ahmed Rashid are an example for this liberal young Turk figures who actually had a federalist idea in mind. So they had accepted the end of Ottomanism, the end of the Ottoman Empire, and they were um, agreeing with the idea of self-determination as long as Turkey would also be a self-determined um, nation. But among those pamphleteers I, I showed, there were also more yeah, right-wing nationalists, especially the ones belonging to the Turkish Nationalist Club in Geneva. Um, many of them later merged with the Kemalists, and um, they rejected Kurdish, um, Kurdish interests or the idea of, of Kurdish autonomy um, very clearly, especially later on at the Lusan Conference. Um, where the emerging national movement in which those people actually kind of, kind of melted um, was representing Turkey. There the um, diplomats argued that uh, the Kurds um, living at the borders, so the contested borders, were actually Turks. So they had these historic uh, anthropological wild theories where they claimed that uh, those, those Kurds were ancient uh, Turks and uh, you know, actually that gave Turkey the right to claim, uh, especially Mosul. Uh, that was their argumentation. Um, the, the second question you raised regarding how informed they were about actually the geographic and political uh, realities. Um, I think there's a reason why they, they decided to send not just one commission to Turkey in 1919, but even two. I mean, next to the King Crane Commission, there was the Herbert Commission, of course. And I really hope that, uh, I really think that they hope that those expert commissions would gather reliable information, not just about uh, geographies, but, but especially about um, political preferences and identities. I mean, they clearly wanted to know who belongs where. And in order to figure that out, they yeah, um, relied on, on those experts. And, and again, this brings me to this double uh, diplomat, Sheriff Pasha, representing uh, Kurdistan and Turkey. Uh, there's a reason why uh, Sheriff Pasha was able um, to seriously propose his plan of, of Kurdistan um, at the Paris Peace Conference. I mean, he was speaking about a national identity, which in that region then didn't really exist. I mean, there existed Kurdish nationalism, but it was an intellectual project of elites living in Istanbul, mainly or abroad. Um, but for pragmatic reasons, but maybe also for reasons, um, for the reason that they weren't properly informed. The Allies 
uh, kind of bought the idea um, that here we have a representative of, of Kurdistan, of a Kurdish nation. So I think that example shows that there clearly was a lack of sort of uh, knowledge of the realities in the region. If that was a conscious or unconscious lack of knowledge, yeah, maybe, maybe both. Okay, uh, does it work? Yeah. As the, <coughs> it's a huge question, if not Lausanne, what? Sèvres. I think uh, it's, it's, it's too hypothetical because uh, we as historians, or, or we, we should benefit from the uh, wisdom of hindsight. It's not about now to decide, decide and to say this or that. We, say, we see that both was not enough to face uh, the challenge of what was then the explicit challenge that was a law-based, a law-based order, domestically and internationally. Uh, and uh, so I would not say we can go back to Sèvres, uh, or, or we must simply accept the real politic of Lausanne. I would say we must, uh, with the, in, 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 an, in an attempt to wisdom of hindsight, uh, take uh, from both what might uh, be uh, real historical wisdom. And regarding Sèvres, it's absolutely the will to give rights to weaker groups that can never be given up. It was dramatic and fatal what happened in Lausanne uh, with, uh, with all the new studies about the reception of Lausanne and, and the and the radical nationalist um, uh, state in, 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 uh, in Turkey then, uh, as the reception in Germany, by, uh, including by Nazis, but more generally speaking, uh, nationalists. Uh, uh, but uh, even after, uh, after the, f uh, the Second World War, the wrong uh, in a way, uh, 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 opinion or, or shortcut thinking uh, of Lausanne as a true solution to ethno-religious problems has brought a lot of damage in the, also in the second uh, half of the 20th century, including in the, in the 1990s regarding ex-Yugoslavia. So we must see the price of Lausanne, a very, very heavy price. So, but if, if you ask me, that's, it's not about going back to Sèvres because what, what I have called the imperial bias. It is a too evident imperial bias that Sèvres was within a, frame, a framework of, of, uh, of the thinking, of political thinking of the modern national uh, empires of, of Britain and France in particular. Uh, so it's about uh, revisiting, questioning, and, 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 and coming to, to the wisdom of hindsight. That's all. And, and, what, and there are minim, minima or <laughs> what, what, that can not, never give given up. And these are, are the fundamental rights uh, that are, uh, of course, more present uh, uh, in, uh, in Sèvres regarding weaker groups, they are uh, discursively, rhetorically present in some regulations of Lausanne as well, but everybody knew that they would never uh, be checked and controlled, and what happened, they were uh, very soon then uh, uh, just uh, cancelled by, by the Kemalist uh, state. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, this is another story, including the introduction of, of, of European law, etc., that uh, was then, in, in, a, in a way, the, the bright side of, of a story that at the same time was the elimination of, of some uh, regulations uh, in the treaty. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we were really. Could, could we ask uh, John to. To, to, to the to, other. And now I'm just going to the oh, next. Uh, uh, no, no, it's too. Uh, shall, shall I not answer the other questions? Uh, if, if just really quickly. Very quickly, quickly. okay. Uh, yeah, uh, that's the, what, what is important to say that the, the, it was absolutely not clear that the Kemalist movement would come to such a uh, big victory. Uh, and that, in a way, the radical version would win over in 1922-1923. So, 
Der Kurz wäre also promised by the nationalist Kemalist movement autonomy. One, uh, when the, when the, uh, yeah, in, in, even in 1922, in, in Parliament discussions in, in, in Ankara. So you must, uh, th that was not just a monolithic uh, plan uh, that one would then really uh, establish uh, um, uh, a monocultural Turkey, that was the military victory and, and the visible weakness of the Western powers that invited them to, to really establish the radical version. But before it was a consensus that the Kurds would also by the Kemalists, because they had to counter the Sevres uh, autonomy plan, given some autonomy, region, regionalism. Yeah, and there were other minorities, and it was absolutely impossible even to mention them. When they were mentioned in the commission discussions in, in Lausanne, the Turkish delegate, Rizanur, just left the room and slapped the door. Also when there were mentioned Alevis, for example, what, what's Alevis? We are all Turks, and Kurds are, all, uh, are Muslims, and they will be part of the Turkish nation. So it was impossible to mention non-Muslim minorities. It was, of course, impossible not to mention the Christian minorities according to the old Ottoman millet tradition that then was also implemented in the Lausanne Treaty, but uh, as I said, uh, largely cancelled uh, soon after. Okay. And, and John, really quickly, yeah, thank you. Just, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll just I'll just add very briefly um, two cents about the Lebanese Syrian mandate um, context or, or case. There, the question of the question of what else or what other, what other system could have prevailed um, for Lebanon, there could have been there was a small Lebanon solution and a greater Lebanon, a petit Liban and a grand Liban, and in some ways it was more it would have been more in the Maronites' interests to advocate for a petit Liban because Mount Lebanon while certainly not free of strife since uh, an 1860 intervention to, to stop Druze um, Maronite violence was, was what one of the things that precipitated this Franco-Lebanese connection, uh, would not have incorporated the substantial numbers of other minority populations, Sunni and Shia Muslim, Druze, um, Alawite, and, and this, this confessional Lebanon is this is the legacy that, that was bequeathed uh, from, from the post-war peace movement um, and, and with disastrous consequences as the Lebanese Civil War um, attested to. And then just very briefly on the question of other minorities in this case, uh, one, one um, strategy that, that was present was a sort of divide and rule strategy. So the French, um, at one point, they, they s experimented with different forms of or administrative organization in, in Lebanon and Syria. At one point, there was an état des Alouites. Um, but the Maronites at the Paris Peace Conference may have had a more willing, that I'm speculating at least, may have had a more willing audience in the French at the Paris Peace Conference than other minorities because of, I'm arguing, some of these affective um, relations that have been cultivated in, in addition to geop geopolitical concerns. Sorry to cut you short, but thank you so much for a stimulating panel. And thank